Okay, all right. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome back. So today we will have the sixth lecture about this phasing workshop. Um, so as usual, we will have a Bayesian warm up. So think about what we have learned from the last time. So the last time we replaced A and B in the Bayesian equation with theta and data, right? And theta is the unknown parameter that we're interested in and the D, the data, is the, the data we collect from the experiments or from any observation. So we turned to a quite concrete example of this globe tosin. So we used a binomial example to illustrate how uh, the Bayesian update can be done conceptually. <clears throat> so just to quickly have a recap of what we have discussed from the last time, so the question we have is you're curious about how much of the surface of the entire Earth is covered in water. You are interested in this question and you would like to do experiments. And as you could imagine, the Earth is, is giant, is gigantic, and you cannot really uh, operate the, the Earth to do something. And instead, you have a small model, right? You have a small toy that you, you, you might use the toy to, um, to do something, to operate it, and then to collect the data, uh, to collect your observation. So the idea you have is so you will toss the globe up in the air and then you catch it. And then you will record whether or not the surface under your right index finger is, is water or land. There's only two possibilities in this, in this case, either, either a water or a land. <clears throat> so this example is basically pretty much similar or actually the same as uh, a coin flipping. So you are interested in if, if a coin is a fair coin. Fair coin means 50% of the chance the head will face up and 50% of the chance the, the tail will face up <clears throat> if you toss and then catch. And let's say if I give you a random coin, you don't know if that, you have no idea if that is a, a fair coin or not. You just basically uh, toss it and then catch it, toss it and catch it. You do a few ex times, right? And you might observe uh, a certain number of tail and a certain number of head. So this is the same as if you toss the globe here and then you have a certain number of water and a certain number of land. This is the same idea. So as I said the last time, this example is just to uh, storylize that a little bit so that you, uh, you, you have more uh, interest. <clears throat> and suppose that you do this simple experiment, you just toss the globe up in the air and you catch it and you record whether or not the surface under you are. Um, uh, right index fingers land uh, or water, you have this observation, for instance, you have nine experiments. So you toast the globe nine times and you catch it every time you uh, make a recording of the results. And then the sequence here up to, uh, as for now, is water land, uh, three times of water consecutively, and then the land, water, land, water. So this, this is the data you have. It's the same as head, tail, head, 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 tail, head, tail, head. So in a coin flipping sample, so then the question now you have is to ask yourself, or we ask ourselves, so what is the, the answer to this question, right? You, you have, you've only done nine times of experiments. And if, by using some intuition enough, you don't have to worry about too much uh, frequency analysis or uh, whatever. So just intu intuitively, you run this experiments nine times and six out of nine times you, you've observed uh, water out of land. So intuitively, you have, you may uh, draw the conclusion that two thirds of the, um, the surface is covered in water. Okay. So uh, what, what we do if we want to use the, the Bayesian uh, statistics to, to solve this problem, right? So we um, came back to the general steps for workflow of doing any kind of uh, statistical modeling or whatever modeling. So we would like to have a data story in the, in the very first place. Data story is something that you would uh, expect how the data, how the observation might rise up. So what is the underlying data generation process, right? So you have a globe and what is the, the underlying mechanism, for example, that's gener gen generated, that, have, uh, that has generated the, the water land, water land sequence. <clears throat> Okay, 
So the assumption we have uh, is that the true proportion, there's, let's say there's a true proportion, okay? So the true proportion of water covering the entire globe is something called theta. So the theta is the unknown parameter, it's unknown variable, let's say, if you don't like the word uh, parameter so far. So it, it is the, the true uh, proportion, something we don't know but we're interested in. And uh, as you could imagine, to each of the single toes of the globe has a probability of, the, of theta, right? So each of the time you throw your catch, you throw your catch, each of the time they all follow the, the same theta. So they all follow the probability of theta that produces water observation. So on the opposite side, if we know that theta is the probability that water is covering the entire um, Earth, uh, you know that 1 minus theta, that's the opposite, is the probability that produces the land observation, that's the opposite. So if you know that uh, theta or some proportion is the, the head facing up of a coin, so if let's say 60% head facing up, then you know of course for sure that then my, 1 minus 60%, that is 40%, the uh, head, the uh, tail, the opposite, tail will uh, face up if you do the coin tossing experiment. This is also uh, the same, okay? So furthermore, we uh, assume, we further assume that, so each of the toes, they are independent of each other. So you toes the glow, you catch it, the results you have, either water or land, does not affect the next time you do the same thing and then does not affect the next observation, right? So each of the toes, catch, toes, catch, they are independent and independently follow the theta and one minus theta uh, proportion to produce either water or land observation. Okay, good. And then the, this process is basically following uh, something called the binomial model, and uh, we will talk about that uh, in a minute. So how, how this update is done, let's say we know the underlying data story, that's our assumption. We assume the data story goes the way we described, and we have the data, right? Again, we have the data. We have the nine times of experiment. We have six times of water out of uh, nine. And there is a sequence, water land, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's our sequence. And then the update, what is the update? So we have a model and before we observe the data, before we collect the data, we might have some knowledge about theta. Let's say that's our prior, okay? So in this case, we have uh, a flat prior Okay, flat prior, this dashed line. And we also know that theta is, it is a proportion. It is a proportion of water covering the entire surface. And we know that proportion is like probability, is a number between zero and one. It has boundaries. So the lower boundary is zero and then the upper boundary is one. So here we uh, show on the x-axis, the boundary, the, uh, the boundary of the, the theta parameter is between zero and one in the, in the units range. Okay, and uh, uh, given this flat prior, what's our prior knowledge basically says that the theta, the proportion, the unknown proportion that we're interested in is possible everywhere. So it's, it's, it's basically everywhere, okay? And they, they have an equal, equal, equal chance. So this theta equals 0.5, the chance of that is the same as theta equals zero, and is the same as the chance equals one, okay? So this is the prior. And when we have the prior and when we have the data, let's say we have trial one, we have one observation, we can already use the Bayesian equation to update the prior knowledge to the posterior. So re recall that the equation of the Bayesian theorem, the Bayesian formula is that we are interested in, in we are interested in the posterior. The posterior equals to the likelihood times the prior, and then divided by some normalization term. That's the, the evidence. We we'll talk about that also later. So every time you do this update, you have a prior, you have a likelihood. Prior in this case, in the current case, is the, the flat line. The likelihood is the, the binomial function, and um, using this, we already could calculate the posterior. Perfect. So the posterior, after observing one uh, data point, water, so you have a posterior line here in this solid line. 
So here, one means 100% uh, covering the 100% water covering the entire surface for the Earth. Here, zero means 0% 0 water, 100% land. Okay. So you have a flat prior, and after observing one water, let's say you just do one time experiment, you observe one water, and then you say, okay, this is 100%, right? <clears throat> Counterintuitively, or maybe intuitively. But anyway, so this posterior basically favors what you have observed. And then you do the second experiment. So out of the two times of experiments, you observe one water and one land. But then only within these two times of observation, it is an equal chance, okay? So then now the new posterior area, it's centered around point five. So it reflects our observation. One water, one land out of two times. So 50% water, 50% of land, right? Perfect. Another observation from this graph is that you, you see, well, the posterior area from the previous update now becomes the prior of the current updates, right? So here, this is a posterior of trail one, and then it is now the prior of trail two. And then we could imagine this curve, now the uh, solid line curve is now the current posterior. You could easily imagine that it will become the prior of trail three, okay? Before observing this three, uh, the third trail, so it is indeed indeed the case. Um, this curve becomes the prior of the next trail. And after observing another water observation, so this curve is shifted a little bit towards uh, the, the water part in favor of more water covering the surface relative to uh, the land. And then you do this kind of updates nine times because we have nine times of observation. So you could see that after, uh, so here, from, from three to four, one more water is observed. So you see the curve, the peak is shifted a little bit more to the right hand side. And here, five, one more water, right? So the curve, the peak is shifted a little bit more towards uh, the right hand side. Um, you might also observe that not only the peak is shifted from somewhere around the center towards a little bit more to the right end, of the unit range, you also see that um, that the width, the, the narrow, the wideness or the narrowness, the, the width, right? How wide it is, the width also changed. So the idea is that um, if you have not too many observations, so here you only observed um, two times of water out of three times of, of experiments. So here the uh, the peak is yeah slightly favor of uh, slightly favors the the water part but you have a greater uncertainty because you, only, you have only done three times of this posing experiment and you have not too much um, confidence, let's say. Uh, this, is a, this, is a, this, is, this is a precise reflection of the, of the entire, uh, of the truth of the truth, okay? But you see, as you observe more data, so the, the curve gets narrower and narrower, and Translating that into statistical knowledge, that basically means that the variance is a little bit reduced, right? When the variance is reduced, you have more confidence to say that, okay, now the peak maybe is somewhere here, and it's, uh, you have more confidence to say that the peak is here uh, than the here, even though the peak is more or less the same, okay? Right, maybe I should uh, compare these two, because these two, the peak location is exactly the same. But the variance, the confidence is changing, of course. <clears throat> and then we have trail uh, seven and eight and nine. Okay, good. So this is the final curve, okay, after uh, the entire nine times of experiments. And we could see that the peak here, it is around two thirds, so six water out of nine times of experiments. And we have a relatively okay ish uh, range of confidence, pre precision, right? Uh, to say that the, the peak is around here, good. And uh, it is quite interesting to compare these three graphs on this column, so trail three, trail six, and trail nine, because so all of them, so all of these three graphs, uh, the, the ratio is two thirds. So here two water out of three, here four water out of six, here six water out of nine. So the ratio is always two over three. 
But as I said, the peak, even though the peak knowledge is the same, we know that the uncertainty, the, the certainty or uncertainty changed as the data point, the, the sample size gets in, increased. Good. Uh, another thing that, that it is not directly illustrated here is that the, that the, <clears throat> the, the order doesn't matter. So the order doesn't matter means if you are only interested in the last part, okay, if you do nine times of experiment, if you always, let's say you have multiple this kind of independent experiments, let's say if you always observe six times of water out of nine, but the, the, the order, the sequence of the, the water land, water land is different, uh, differs between all these kind of experiments. So then the order is not the same from time to time. But as long as you have six times of water out of nine, you will always end up this final curve, okay? And of course, the intermediate uh, steps in, in the middle, somewhere here and here, that they change, they, they really, they change. But the final one, the final one is always this one, the final one is always the same, okay? So here the two thirds is the, the peak knowledge, and uh, we know that. Uh, the third point is quite important. This means, and uh, the other theta value, they are not ruled out by this kind of analysis. What, what that means? <clears throat> so that means, it means that theta is, so here this x-axis, the proportion of water, right? So this is the theta parameter that we're interested in. So the theta parameter, uh, before we collect the data, we know that in between zero and one, so here the up corner, up left corner, top left corner, so in between zero and one, the theta parameter is possible everywhere. Okay, it's possible everywhere. And then after we have done this experiment nine times, observing six times of water, we know that the theta is most likely to be here, to be two thirds, but all the other theta values are also possible. So if you have a theta, the proportion of 0.5, it's also possible that if you do experiments nine times, this experiment nine times, you also observe six times of water. If you have a parameter, the theta is somewhere around here, I'm not really sure, but let's say around 0.8. It is, it's not, it is not impossible, right? It is still possible that you have a koi, 80% tail, 20% uh, head, if you throw it, you still might observe nine out of, uh, six out of nine tails. Right, so this is something that you could uh, imagine. By chance, it could happen also, right? So this entire distribution reflects our knowledge of the, the all the range, the full range. We, we are not only interested in what is the, the peak, the point. So this is now the difference between the Bayesian um, inference and the point estimation. So if you do a point estimation, you get only one number. You get only two thirds in this case. You say, well, the parameter that maximize the likelihood, if you run maximum, maximum, maximum likelihood estimation, maximum likelihood estimation, MLE, if you only do the point estimation, then you get only one number. So these two thirds will be the parameter that maximize the likelihood of the, of the data, given a binomial model, of course. You get one number. But in this Bayesian equation, you, you get a peak, yes, but you also, on top of that, you get an entire distribution. <clears throat> And using this entire distribution, uh, you have the uncertainty. This is new, right? You have the uncertainty. You, you, you could use the entire curve to describe the uncertainty of the parameter. So everything in between zero and one, they have a relative po uh, possibility. So here the parameter theta being 0.5, it is less likely to produce the data uh, of two, uh, six out of nine times of uh, toes less likely relative to this point, but it is still possible. It is still possible. And then this number, this value here, it, it, you cannot get this calculation by using maximum likelihood calculation. And uh, as I said, by comparing these two graphs here, this one, this one, and this one, the three uh, right most graphs on the column. So if you compare these three graph, graphs, as I said, all of them, they have a ratio of two thirds two water over three um, uh, experiments, the ratio, always two thirds. So if you run 
a maximum likelihood estimation. Let's say we run, we, we do experiments three times. We observe two water, so we get this. Um, six times of experiments, four water. Nine times of experiments, six water. So let's say we do this three experiments. We do the experiments three times. Uh, one time we do three trials, another time we do six trials, and then the third time we do nine trials. So all these three experiments we will observe by using maximum likelihood estimation, the parameter will be two thirds. Okay, the same. But what, what differs, right? We, we have no idea. If we use maximum, li uh, like maximum likelihood estimation, we have not, not really uh, further knowledge that could actually reflect the difference between the three experiments. The sample size has increased. But if we use this analysis, we know that the uncertainty got reduced. So even though the ratio is always the same, but uncertainty we observed um, here, here, and here, they got reduced. So basically we have more confidence to say that the peak is, is wrong here. If we do nine times of experiment relative to if we do uh, three times of experiments. <clears throat> Good. Okay, now I have time to answer some questions. So one is how, how important is the accuracy of the prior for this computation? So yeah, we will get back to the prior thing. Um, the general idea is that if you still remember the Bayesian formula, so the posterior equals to the max, uh, equals to the likelihood multiplied with the prior, right? And then normalize it. So it's basically a product between the likelihood and uh, the prior. So you could also imagine that this is somehow a, a weighted multiplication. So if you have not too many data points, so if your sample size is small, for example, then the prior might have a larger impact. But if you say we have a huge number of trials or a huge number of participants, if we do this coin or a globe example um, 9,000 times and we observe 6,000 of water, so then you could imagine um, this curve will be picked and then the impact of the prior will also be uh, minimized. So the idea to simply put, so if you have not too many data points, if you have a small sample size, then the prior might matter. If you have a lot of data, you have an adequate amount of data points, trials or participants, then the prior trials might not in, in, in fact uh, affect the, the results too much. Okay. And then another concern you might have is, so where do I get these priors, right? So one possibility is, okay, you just say this is a flat prior, it's okay. And then we actually discussed the prior twice, uh, one or two lectures before. So another uh, possibility instead of this flat prior is we use weekly informative prior, okay? So weekly informative prior means we have some kind of knowledge, but it is not so precise. It is weak. It's, we have not too much certainty about that. We could assume um, uh, the water proportion is 50% of prior knowledge before doing experiment. We could say it's around 50%. So then we could have a curve around here, right? A little bit shorter than this curve. Let's say it is some, 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 somehow here. So we could use this one as another prior, centered around 50%, but, and then uh, later uh, the other points are, are a little bit less likely. So this is, a, and this is another prior option, prior alternative. <clears throat> Good. Another question is, to what degree uh, would the graph differ when you would just calculate the likelihood for different P values and then plot them. Do you mean the p value or the theta value? The theta, okay. Um, in this case, it will not change. So if, let's say, because this prior is flat, okay, this flat is, uh, this prior is flat. 
So this line is basically the, 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 the curve of the, the likelihoods. Well, it, it, it's, I, I will tell you later what is the difference. So now what I plot the solid curve, it is a, a probability density. So the assumption, not the assumption, the requirement, the criteria we talk about is that the area under the curve, okay, the area under the curve of this solid line and also the dashed line as well. So the area under the curve of those lines, they, they, are, they are one, they sum up to one. So this is a probability. So what I plot here is the probability. And then if, let's say, we plot the likelihoods of all these things, the curve, the shape will be pretty much the same. So that the shape, I only mean the shape. So let's say they are similar or the, or the same. But if you look at the y-axis, I, did, I didn't put the y-axis here, but if you do that, and if you plot the y-axis, you will see that the y-axis is different. So uh, the idea is the likelihood is not a normalized curve, and then the likelihood is not probability, and then this goes back to our discussion before, right? Likelihood, because the data is fixed, not a parameter, and uh, its area under the curve does not sum up to one, okay? But we will see this much better in the exercise. So to uh, simplify my answer, if I plot, if I do two plots, one I plot posterior probability, the other one is I plot the likelihood. The shape will be quite the same, but uh, the y-axis, the magnitude, they differ. So if it is the probability, the area under the curve sum up to one, if it is the case of likelihood, the area under the curve does not sum up to one, maybe larger, maybe smaller. In this case, I guess it's larger. Good. Other questions? But does that answer the question? Yeah, no? Yeah, cool. Thank you. Good. So this is a, a quick summary, not really quick, but I guess it's, um, you understand better right now, all of you. That's uh, how the Bayesian updates works. Perfect. Um, so this quick summary basically tells you conceptually how the Bayesian update works. We have a prior and we update, it goes from the flat prior to this line and it goes from this curve to, no, it goes from this line to this curve and then it updates, um, runs again and again for nine times. So conceptually, we all understand now how this curve shifts on the i-axis, how the peak and the, the, the uncertainty changes as uh, we have observed more data. Everyone understand that? And now the question is practically, so how, how do we get here, right? How do we get this line? How can we um, use R, for example, to calculate this curve, right? This is a practical question. We have the data, we have a model, binomial, we have a prior, okay, we, we, we have everything, right? So how to, how to get this line, okay? How to get this curve? So because this case is quite straightforward, it is, there is only one parameter, the theta, the proportion. Uh, we have a relatively simple model, the binomial model. We have not too many data points, nine and uh, six. So we could actually do this analysis. <clears throat> we could actually derive this curve uh, by hand. So it, there, is a, there is a analytical solution. Okay, if you're interested, you can actually do this. And now what we do is that instead, uh, we do something called a grid approximation. So we want to solve it. So one way, as I said, verbally, you can do this analytic analytically because it is relatively easy. And another way is you want, if you want to solve it, use uh, R. You can, you can also use the R to solve it analytically, honestly. But let's say if we want to use another method to, to solve the curve, we could use something called a grid approximation. So what is, what is a grid approximation? Grid is like the, the grid, okay? And the grid approximation is uh, trying to convert a continuous problem into a discrete problem, okay? So here, what I show you is the Bayesian formula when it is a discrete theta, okay, when theta is discrete. And then if you recall from our previous discussion, the denominator 
is a marginal likelihood. So you marginalize all those possible thetas and then you sum it up, okay? So this, this is when we have a discrete parameter example. So um, back to the example when we discussed being cold and being rainy, back to also the example when we discussed the, the hair color and the eye color. So we have the marginal probability, right? So they, they, they serve um, the role of the denominator. Good. Basically, it, we, we can sum things up, right? We can sum things up, then that's easier to, to understand. And then the theta parameter here, it is, it is continuous. We cannot really do the summing up. So instead, what we do is that we do the, the integral, okay? So we still do this marginal probability. The marginal probability is always the same. So the difference is that how we get the marginal probability. One way is to sum over all those possible thetas, discrete thetas, okay? Because it is a, there is a limited, finite, finite number, number of theta possibilities. We, we could sum them up. And in this case, on the, on the lower part, so this theta, because that's continuous, we, in theory, have an infinite number of possibilities. It is, it's infinite. We cannot really sum them up by uh, doing an infinite number of calculations. That's, that's uh, not possible, right? But we, there is a way to do it. That is to, there, it, it is to do the integral, okay? But maybe if, if, you, do not, if you do not like the integral part, you, you do like the, the discrete calculation because that's straightforward and uh, relatively easy. So how we could convert the continuous problem into a discrete problem. So this is the purpose of the grid approximation. So we convert the continuous problem into a discrete problem. And for a discrete problem, we know how to solve it relatively easily, okay? So here, if you look at the graph here down uh, the bottom right corner, the blue curve, it is continuous. And then we find divide, divide this a and B space between the range A and B into smaller steps. So then that forms the grid. And then we use this point. So if you now look at the red curve, it is uh, trying to approximate the shape of the blue curve. As you could imagine, the more fine grade um, steps we have, the better we will approximate the continuous curve, right? So in this case, we only have one, two, three, four, five, six, six points dividing the space A and B. So we have uh, five, one, two, three. Yeah, we have five uh, little steps in between. And then we could use this number to uh, approximate the curve. So you'll see here the approximation goes relatively well and here maybe it could be better. But as long as we have another dot here, then you see the approximation, the approximation would work well, okay? The idea is, again, um, let me re repeat myself, to convert a continuous problem into a discrete problem using grade approximation because this grade problem is relatively easier to solve. Okay, good. So now we can go back to uh, the binomial model, finally, the globe example. On the uh, graph, so on the equation here, right-hand side, this is the original formula. And we have, wait a minute. So we have, this, this is a generic one, right? This is the generic formula. And the top, the numerator here, PD given theta, so this is the likelihood. This one is the likelihood. So what is the likelihood specifically to our example? It is a binomial I mentioned a few times. How does that how does that look like? And so it looks it looks like here. So the capital N is the total number of experiments. <coughs> Excuse me. So total number of experiment is capital N in this case nine, right? Uh, the small W here it is the total number of water. So six in this case. And uh, here the theta is the, the proportion. Okay. And then this thing is the, the bin binomial uh, function. Good. And as long as we have this, we could solve that by using the grid approximation. And let's see how that is done in R. Good. Uh, 
first we define a range, right? We define a range of theta. Theta, as I said, is a number between zero and one. So start from zero and end of one. And let's say we divide this space between zero and one into 20 steps. So the number of grade is 20. Okay, good, 20. And we define our data. So the data is easy. We have six times of water, nine times of experiments. Good. And then now you will define the grade. So uh, you say the theta grade is a sequence from zero to one by 20 times. Okay. So the sequence SEQ is a function that produces a sequence of numbers. You give the start, you give the, the finish, you give how many uh, numbers you want in total so that it will return you a evenly spaced evenly divided uh, sequence, evenly spaced uh, sequence. Now the prior, prior you basically say, well, I want to repeat one 20 times, okay? Because I divide the space into 20 steps, I also need the prior for 20 steps. You know, the prior is also continuous, right? The prior is a, is a flat line, and the line is also continuous. Um, the, the division, a great approximation also applies to the prior. So now you repeat one, uh, 20 times, so it will just basically be one, 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 one for 20 times. This is a prior. Okay, this is finally the, the, the very core part. The most important part of this entire script is how to calculate the likelihood. Because here, whatever this they, they, is, is straightforward, it's easy, not too much to say, I don't have to explain even. This likelihood part, this is the, the key of this grid approximation because we want to reflect the binomial model, right? So. Um, here, this is the function that calculates the, the likelihood of a binomial distribution. So the B norm here, or binorm, it means the binomial. So what this D means, so there is a little D, the letter, in front of the, the binomial, binorm. So recall we have discussed in R, um, for any distribution names, we could have four letters we put that the prefix in front of the distribution name we could have a p and d and a q and a r if you still remember what i'm talking about the d here the d is the the density function the pdf and uh, the p is the cumulative density function so D norm is the, uh, the PDF of normal distribution. Then and the P norm is the cumulative density function. The Q norm, the Q letter is the, the quantile, okay? The inverse of the cumulative. And then the R norm, the finally there's the R norm. R norm basically means I want to get random numbers from the, the normal distribution. So here we would like to use the density function, or in this case, to be precise, it is a probability uh, that's the function of the binomial. Good. Well, I mean, to be precise, this is the probability mass function because the, the outcome is discrete, right? Okay, good. So, give, so here we give basically the, the input. So W is as here, W, and then capital N is N, and then we give the, uh, the grades, okay? So here, we give the grid. And then this calculation will calculate uh, the likelihood per 20 step, so per step. And then what we will get by using this is the likelihood for each possible theta parameter divided by 20 in the range between zero and one, uh, given the data of nine water out of, uh, nine, six water out of nine experiments. So this is the likelihood, right? So the, the, uh, the way to describe it in the equation is already quite informative, I think. So the likelihood for each theta after observing six water out of nine, okay? So the idea, uh, if you are still confused, is let's say the theta, for example, can be 0.1. The theta, for example, can be 0.2. The theta, for example, can be 0.3. And you are calculating what the likelihood is when the theta is 0.1, given 
six more out of nine. And again, what's the likelihood is of theta being 0 0.2 given six water out of nine? And what the likelihood is of theta being 0.3 uh, given the data six water out of nine? Okay, you do this many times, as many times as the number of grid. So you calculate the likelihood per parameter, right? And finally, so you know the equation, the product of the numerator is the here, likelihood multiplied with the prior. So you will do the simple multiplication, likelihood multiplied with the prior, good. And the last step is, well, we have to normalize it, right? right? So here, uh, these products only, if we only do the product, this one will be the unstandardized prior. If we do have to standardize it, we take the sum of all of the possibilities, and it's, this one will become the standardized post theory. Good. And then if you do this calculation, we will get this nice curve, right? Dividing the space between zero and one into 20 steps, and then we calculate the likelihood per each step, and then we use the, the formula to get the entire here posterior distribution of theta. <clears throat> Any questions up to here? Everything's all right? So I encourage you at home to do this exercise. Um, you can, in theory, run all of this. What you can change is, for example, you can change the number of grade from 20 to 50, for example. And then what I would also like to encourage you do is to do is you do this calculation and then you plot the curve of this unstandardized posterior and this one, the standardized posterior. So you will see that the shape, as I said, will be pretty much the same. But if you look at the scale, the y-axis, they, they differ. And one is here, this one, it refers probability, this one, it doesn't. So the y-axis, it's, it's different. What I can tell you now is the y-axis for this unstandardized posterior is, is, is larger, right? So on, on average, the scale is larger relative to this one. This is smaller. So there is a question. It says, will the theta grid always be between zero and one, or are there cases where we limit it? So in this case, in our current example, the proportion, theta is a proportion proportion has to be between zero and one. So if in another example, we could also use the grid approximation to solve a linear, simple linear regression, we could do the same, right? Um, for a simple linear regression, the intercept parameter and the, the slope parameter, the two parameters, they, they have no limit. It, it, in theory, they, they can be anything, right? So then there's one of the dis disadvantage of using grid approximation for unlimited prior, uh, unlimited parameter, because how can you give a range of an unlim unlimited prior? You could, you could give a relatively large range. Let's say if you run the regression model, uh, let's say you give the slope parameter to be between minus 500 to positive 500. This is a relatively and reasonably large uh, range, but still it's in theory possible that the slope is above uh, 500 and smaller than uh, minus 500. So one way to kind of solve it is to standardize the data in your linear regression. So then the slope might not be that large. So the slope is kind of within uh, minus five and five is okay, right? But as I said, you have to arbitrarily superimpose a limit 
to a parameter that in fact doesn't have a range. But to answer, answer this question here directly is, well, the theta by definition is a number between zero and one. And then we use zero and one as the, the lower and upper bound. Any more questions? So after today's lecture, I think if you have time, if you have five time, five minutes uh, of time, maximum is enough. So you go to the folder you have downloaded. There is a folder zero two binomial globe. So that one, you go to this piece of code, you run it, and then you, you see how the curve of this unstandardized post area differs from the standardized post area. It's only five minutes of uh, trying to execute the code to see, to have a feeling of the grid approximation. Perfect. Any other questions, comments? or everything is fine. <clears throat> okay, good, so I continue. So this is the result, right, good. So, he, so here, if I, suppose if I plot the unstandardized posterior on top of this curve, it will be like, like this. The same shape, but then the y-axis is larger because again, that's unstandardized, not yet normalized. Good. <clears throat> So this one we have seen from the last time, from the last lecture, and it is to show you the impacts of different prior choices. We have used here this, flat prior, so, and there is a possibility to have two other, even though they look quite weird, but it's possible, right? So one prior is this, which simply means uh, the water proportion is not possible in between zero and the point five, and it is then it then has equal chance uh, to be between zero of point five and one. Okay, and then there is another <clears throat> prior, which means um, the prior knowledge reflects there is a reasonable amount of certainty that the water proportion is 0.5, and then the other is lower. Good, so th those are three priors. And then we know that if you do the calculation from, from, the, uh, uh, from the binomial function, the, the, the likelihood here, the calculation is always this. If we have the six water, nine times of experiment example, this is always the same. And now we can see how the prior will change the shape of the posterior. That you see here, a flat line multiplied with this, it is the same, right? Doesn't change the shape of the likelihood. But if we have a prior of this, and then you multiply that with the likelihood, you will see uh, the other part here does not really uh, differ too much from this, but here, this is reflects the, the, the knowledge of the prior. So you could say, well, here, this is zero. All those numbers are zero, 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 zero. So zero multiply with something, you get zero again, okay? That's the idea. And then this one, similarly, uh, you multiply that uh, with the likelihood and then you get this shape of post theory. Good. So there is a question, it asks, so would this be the case where you say the start is 0.5 and then um, the end is one? Yes, yes. So here, if you want to solve this problem, you can say, we want to have a grid approximation. You have multiple steps here between 0.5 and one, okay? Between 0.5 and one, perfect. So here, it, this is the path of the folder that you can go to to do this exercise. So one thing, as I said, you can change 20 to 50, then you will have a finer grade approximation. 
And then another thing I, I told you to do is uh, to plot, to check, to see the difference of the plots of the unstandardized posterior and the standardized posterior. Okay. So now another question you might wonder is that now this is the example I have shown you. I, I show you that this is a globe tossing example. This is a coin flipping example. They are the same, and then they follow something called a binomial distribution. And uh, we know well the binomial distribution in this case that's the likelihood. So uh, well, I, I have to say the other way around. So in this case, the likelihood function is the binomial function. But what if I do not have this kind of data? I have maybe some continuous data. I, have, I want to do a regression. So what is the likelihood of a regression analysis? So what is the likelihood of a neuron spikes, for example, within a limited time period? And what if we have uh, multiple, um, so something called multivariate distributions? So what, what are the likelihoods? So how, the question is simply put, how, I'm, am I supposed to know the, the type of the likelihood function per different of data points or data type that we have observed? Or another, case, another way to rephrase myself is we, have, we do experiments, we collect the data, and we want, we want to model it. And what is the proper likelihood function to model the data that we have at hand? So this is the question. We have the data, we want to model it. What, what model do we choose? So this is the question. The model is the likelihood, right? So how, how should I know, how I'm supposed to know different likelihoods? So um, to, after we know, after I have rephrased my question, now you, you, will, understand, you will try to imagine the, what you have learned from your statistics class, what distribution functions we have learned from before. So now I'm talking about the binomial, there's a normal distribution, there's something called Poisson distribution, and a lot, so multinomial, uh, and uh, multivariate normal, a lot, a lot. So, don't, don't, don't get confused, doesn't matter. If you don't have to know everything. So the, now the solution is, there is a very interesting decision tree, okay? So the first, very first step <clears throat> is to ask yourself, is your data uh, continuous or discrete? So in this case, the nine water six time of experiment, they are continuous data. But no, no, they, they are discrete data. And if, if you measure something like a height or a weight, so the height and weight, they are continuous data. So the first thing you ask yourself is to decide, um, not to decide, is to is examine uh, what data type do you have? So is the data discrete or is the data continuous, okay? So if the data is continuous, you go somewhere here. I don't have to show you everything, but you, you, there is a decision tree. And then you ask yourself another question and then later on you go to some solutions. And then if your data is discrete, you ask further questions, and you, you, down, you go down here and here, and then here, in this case, this is the binomial, okay? You have to go through quite a few steps uh, to know which is the proper likelihood function that you are using, good. The decision tree here looks rather complex, so what I can tell you now is, don't worry too much, so in the field of of psychology and uh, cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience, if we do not really talk about neuron data, like really the neuron data recorded by, uh, by uh, single unit recordings, the spikes, if we do not talk about that, we only talk about behavior, for example, we only talk about button price, we talk about reaction time. If we only talk about this, we do not really have to worry about too much uh, the distribution. There are not too many we can use. So one is the binomial, of course, here, yes, the, the one, two, one, two, head tail, head tail is like button price. It's the same as button price. And uh, uh, any continuous distribution can be uh, modeled by a normal distribution or a transformation of a normal distribution, something like a log normal. So you take the logarithm of a normal distribution. In this case, you can analyze the reaction time. So that's um, uh, one possibility. And then let's say if the button price is not one, two, uh, one, two, or zero, one, zero, one, you have multiple if you have a one, two, three uh, response, or if you have a questionnaire data, that's a scale, how likely do you think that reflects your thoughts? Zero, not, not at all, and nine, very much, 100%. So zero to one, 10, 10 points. 
this data can be uh, modeled by something called a ordinary logistic regression. Okay, that's not even here. But uh, that somehow can be derived from, from a simple um, distribution. Okay. So uh, the idea I, I would like to express here is there is, a, there is a decision tree, so there is a map. So if you have a problem at hand, you know where to go to, you know where to Google it. It is not that you have to memorize everything. So I'm basically trying to give you a starting point. So you, if you, whenever you have a problem, you know where to, uh, to the find the proper solutions. You maybe go here, decision tree, or maybe ask uh, uh, on Google. But before asking, you have to know how to phrase your question properly. And then to help you to, uh, to phrase, to help you phrase the question much more properly, if you go to Google, then you have to know a little bit where to start. So this is the start. Good. And another thing that I would like to emphasize here is that, so the distribution, the shapes and the everything, it is, if you are a beginner, if you just, if you are just into this, so what, one thing that can be challenging is that you, you don't know how that looks like, right? So you know the normal distribution as a bell curve, uh, symmetrically distributed, which is very nice. We know that from quite a few years ago. And what are the shape of the other distributions? If I tell you there's something called a log normal distribution, how does that look like? If I tell you there is a binomial uh, distribution, how does that look like? If I tell you there is a multivariate normal distribution, like a two-dimensional Gaussian normal, how does that look like? So you don't know <laughs> if you have no idea yet. Um, but before to go to the, the equation, you, you could look at the equation on Wikipedia, the formula to imagine how the shape, how the curve might look like. But that is not also um, ideal in, uh, uh, in, the, in the learning perspective. So how to do it? So the solution is to build intuitions. So you go to some website to see how the curve looks like if you change the parameter. So back again to the example of normal distribution, there are only two parameters. One is the, the mean, uh, the center of the normal distribution. The other one is the, the variance, the standard deviation of the normal distribution. So if you, you say, if, if, you, if you change the, the mean, you will shift the curve on the x-axis, either to the left or to the right, you change the position. And then if you change the standard deviation of the normal distribution, you change the, the, the width, right? And the, the whiteness of the curve. You know how this works. And then if you understand that, that really helps uh, you build your intuition of the distribution. And if you have another distribution, you can do the same. You change the parameter of the distribution and then see how this parameter change the shape of that particular distribution. And fortunately, there is a tool that could uh, help you to achieve this goal. So in this case, uh, there's something called, the, the place is called a distribution zoo. So it is a, is a zoo of distributions. First step is to change, to choose what data do you have? Something like here, the same. Do you have a continuous data or do you, ca do you have a discrete data? And then in this case, for instance, if you have a discrete distribution, if you have a binomial, okay? So here, the size, this is the total number of experiments, the nine times of experiment in our example. And then this probability is the proportion, the theta. So then here, it is the binomial distribution when capital N is 10 and when the, the theta parameter is 27. And then you see, the distribution. And you can, of course, change the size to be something like here, 50, I guess, and then change the pro pro probability, the proportion to be 0 0.2, I think. You can do that. And then you will see a change of the distribution here immediately. And then this really helps uh, us build intuition of different types of distribution. And another case, so if we have a multivariate example, if we have a multivariate normal distribution, we have two variables, one is x, the other one is y, and they are, there is a, a multivariate Gaussian, you can change uh, the, the mean parameter of both of the, the two distributions and also the variance. So in this case, there is zero 
correlation between the two variables. And in this case, the, the mean of x is zero, the mean of y is also zero, and they have equal uh, standard deviation. But if you change it, the, the shape will also be changed. So you will see how that affects um, the, the, the shape, the curve of the distribution. Okay, good. I think I spent here nearly 10 minutes to describe only the two graphs. Actually, you can go to the website. But as I said, again, one more time, the goal is not to memorize everything. The goal is to know where to start. And if you want to learn, you can, do, you can build intuition by using this website. Okay? So now continue. Um, so I've talked about one limitation of using grid approximation. So one limitation, that, that limitation is if we have a, oops, if we have a unlimited, unlimited parameter, it's quite difficult, uh, it's quite challenging to justify the range because if you want to use the grid approximation, you do have to have a range. But it's, if, in theory, the parameter doesn't have a range. You have to justify a range, right? You have to choose a range, and then you have to justify it. This is one of the, the limitations. That, limi that limitation is not really too problematic, actually, because you can use some domain knowledge to justify a relatively decent range of the parameter. So the bigger limitation of a great approximation is what if we have a relatively complex model? So look at here again. This is the Bayesian uh, formula when we have a continuous parameter, when we have only one theta, okay? Let's assume this theta means one parameter. But what if we have two parameters? What if we have five parameters? What if we have 10 parameters? Imagine if you want to use a grid approximation when we have two parameters, you do have to kind of to write a nested loop or ish kind of thing to have a really a two dimensional grid basically whatever you, however you achieve it. Loop is not necessary, but you do have to achieve a two-dimensional grid. And if you have a five parameters example, then you will have a five-dimensional space of a grid. Okay, that doesn't sound nice <laughs> because it's quite difficult to, to, uh, to imagine. And what if you have a 10 parameter example, then you will have a, you will have, have you will have a, uh, a ten dimensional grid space okay and uh, the a grid approximation is simply to calculate the likelihood per small step on the grid okay so if we divide the parameter space between zero and one into twenty steps, we have twenty steps of course if we have two parameters, for example, both of them are between zero and one if we find divide both of the, the unit range parameter into 20 steps. So in total, we will have 20 multiply 20, 400 steps, right? So 20 times 20, we have 400 times of different combinations. And then we use these 400 numbers to calculate the likelihood. Okay, good, still doable. And if, if we have three, then we will have 20 to the power of three different combinations. If we have five parameters, that then we will have 20 to the power of five. If we have 10, then it's 20 raised to 10, right? This is a lot, a huge number of combinations. And if you could imagine the time that's, uh, it, that will be consumed to achieve this grid approximate, approximation is like exponential, of course. Good. So if you're curious, then the, the denominator for two parameter example will look like this. So if we have a 100 parameter example, so then it looks like this. You don't have to, you don't have to even look at too much. So that's really quite complicated. So our goal, recall that our goal is always to solve here, to solve this part, the, the posterior. So I, I tell, I told, I've told you there are multiple ways to solve it. One way is to do it analytically, but when the model, when the, uh, the parameter is getting too, the number of parameters is getting too much, too many, it's too, too many, too complicated, then the analytical solution most of the time doesn't really exist anymore. So you cannot really solve it by paper and pen, it's not possible. And then the grid approximation, I told you, if you have many parameters, then, uh, 
the, the computer maybe just is not able to solve it anymore within a reasonable amount of time. It runs forever, basically. And uh, as you could see here, so the challenging, the challenging part only, the, the challenging part in fact only happens here at the, the denominator part. So the denominator is the place where everything gets too complicated, unnecessarily complicated. So um, the physics, some physicists they, they, in, the, in, in history, so they first came up to the solution. So if the denominator is too complicated and it's not really something uh, uh, helpful, it's only a normalizing term. term. Recall that the unstandardized uh, distribution, the likelihood, and the standardized curve. So the curve, they, they, they are the same. They contain somehow the similar information. We know where the peak is. We know how wide, um, how uncertain the curve looks like, the variance. We know that. The only difference is one is normalized, the other one is not normalized. So the denominator part is one for one complicated. For two, it only has a normalizing role. It doesn't have too much to do with the, the entire shape, the actual shape. So how, how, how to do, right? It's, it's basically useless. So if it is useless, we just get rid of it. So then we will have to use the property, say here is quite easy to understand. The posterior is proportional to the multiplication between the likelihood and the prior. So here we change the equal sign to a proportional sign when we get rid of the denominator. And then when we have this, property we could use some we could use the another method that is called the Markov chain Monte Carlo the MCMC to solve the posterior. Okay. So this is the goal. This is the goal. <clears throat> Good. To summarize a bit, um, when we have complicated models or complex models in general, doesn't have to be complicated, just complex. Analytical solutions and the grid approximation, they just don't work. And we want to have alternatives. So the alternative takes the, the advantage that the posterior is proportional to the product between the likelihood and the prior. And then this new method is called uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo, okay? And then the next chapter is about Markov chain Monte Carlo. But this can be a little bit technical, so be prepared. Uh, you do not have to understand everything, but I think the conceptual part you do, you do have to understand. I will also try to give you examples so you could build some intuitions about Markov chain Monte Carlo. So after that, if you think this is too much, the only thing that you should remember is that Markov chain, Markov chain Monte Carlo or MCMC is basically to help us get the shape of the posterior. Okay, it's, it helps us to solve the Bayesian thing and then it could help us get the posterior. This is MCMC does. Okay, good. So now let's go to this a little bit deeper. Um, <clears throat> so this one we have seen. So we have data, we have model, and then we feed the model to the data and uh, we feed the model to the data by approximation or by MCMC. So here this is uh, where MCMC functions, where MCMC works. It is a parameter estimation technique. Good. So solving the problem by approximation, so we take the property, and then there are two ways. So one way is to uh, use something called a deterministic approximation, and another one is stochastic approximation, okay? So this one here could use something called a variation, variational base, so variational methods, and another one here is the sampling methods. So MCMC belongs to this category, okay? So I can tell you a little bit here. So if you have an unknown distribution, maybe it's too complicated, you have two ways to solve it. So let's say you have an unknown curve. You, you want to get the shape. So one way is to draw samples from the curve. And then the samples, if you draw a reasonable number of samples, if you take the histogram, the sample will resemble the shape of the curve, right? So this is one way. Another way is um, if the curve is unknown, but you have, sub, you have some knowledge of known curve. So you can use the known curve to approximate the unknown curve. 
And then you can calculate the, de the deviance between the known curve and the unknown curve by some calculation. Even though that's unknown, it's possible to calculate the deviance. And then the best approximation will be a approximation of using the, the known curve, right? So here, to use the known curve to approximate the unknown uses this part. And then to draw random samples from the unknown curve, it is the, another part, that's the right-hand side. So we focus on here in this seminar. <clears throat> Good. So now this is the intuition part. And I, I do believe that I have time to finish today, this part. So look at here. This solid line is the, the unknown part, the unknown uh, product. So okay, here, right? So this is the unknown product between the likelihood and the, the prior. And what we want to know, so try to imagine again what we are trying to solve. So we want it to, we want, we would like to solve on this curve to where is high, where is low, right? We want to know where is high in this case and where is low in this case. And uh, uh, the, the shape is not something uh, quite standard and we could, we wanted to draw random samples from the, from the curve and then we want to approximate the shape of the cur curve. Okay, good. So let's imagine this curve is not a product between prior and likelihood. Let's imagine this is something like a, like a two-dimensional mountain in front of you, okay? Let's say this is a mountain. And then the mountain has peaks, the mountain has valleys. So in theory, the, the mountain has somewhere high and somewhere low, good. So let's say, imagine if you are standing in front of a mountain, you can use your eye to look at where is high, where is low, right? If you go hiking, you can look at where is high, where is low, where is a, there's a peak or, or, or not, okay? But let's say uh, we want to set up a robot that will return the height information of the mountain. Let's say the robot doesn't have a vision. So let's say the robots, unlike us, could see where the mountain is high, where the mountain is low, uh, it cannot see. Let's say, right, the, model, the, the robot cannot see anything. But instead, what the robot has or what the robot does is there is a, there is a um, elevation sensor. So the elevation sensor means uh, it returns us the elevation of each single point the robot is visiting, okay? So let's say if the robot is visiting somewhere relatively higher, the elevation might be 400 meters about sea level. If the robot is visiting somewhere relatively lower, maybe the elevation is around uh, 50 meters about sea level, okay? So if that's in Vienna, so maybe the, the average uh, elevation above sea level is I'm not really sure, it's around 200 or 300. And if it's somewhere around uh, the mountains, then it's, it's a lot, right? It's 1,000 or even higher, okay? So that's the elevation above sea level. So the assumption is the, the robot has a elevation sensor. So uh, it records at each feet, uh, ge geographical position where it is high and where it is low, okay? This is one assumption. So the robot has a elevation sensor. So another assumption is the robot has to move, right? The, the goal, you imagine the goal of the robot is to try to find where is high, where is low. It has elevation sensor, so it goes around, it recalls the elevation of, the, of a certain range area, okay? So one way of the moving, so the, the robot has to move so that it explores the area relatively efficiently. And one way is to random, to have a random uh, visit. So the, the robot randomly visit here and there, so then uh, it recalls, recalls the position and the relative uh, and the, the corresponding elevation, elevation information of each position, good. But if you say, okay, this um, 
random visiting is not efficient enough. There is no systematic approach that the robot will go to the, uh, the higher place relatively often than the other places. So back to this mountain example, the, if the mountain has somewhere high, some, if the mountain has somewhere high and also somewhere low, we would like the robot to visit the higher place relatively often, right? Uh, than the others, than the other places. And then you have to have a smarter robot that does this. And one way uh, to do this a little bit smarter is to calculate the ratio of the elevation in the new place relative to the elevation of the previous location. Good, so now we can go back to this curve, finally. So here, this is the mountain, good. And then this small thing, there's the little person, that's the MCMC robots. And then here, this one, here, this one, this is the elevation of the previous space. Let's say this is a proposed new location. So the robot has to move from one location to the other. So the robot makes a proposal. And then there's an algorithm that decides if this proposal will be accepted or not. So let's say the robot is proposing to move from here to here. And uh, the elevation of the previous location is here. And then the elevation of the new place is here. So the robot simply does the ratio of the elevation between the new place and the old place. In this case, the ratio is above one. So then this means the robot is climbing, right? It's going up. So if the robot is going up, this is something we want. We want to have, uh, we want to know where it's high, where it's low. And if the robot is going up, that's good. This is what we want. So then the algorithm will accept this proposal. So then the robot will go up. Good. And you imagine this, this robot goes here and is makes a new proposal to go here and then maybe go here. And then at some point, the robot is nearly at the mountain of, it, it's nearly at the top of the mountain. But let's say we predefine the robot has to, has to explore the entire space for 10,000 times. So if the robot is already at the top of the mountain, it still has to make proposals, right? But if let's say it's only halfway, so out of 10,000 times, now it's uh, 5,000 times, there is, there is still another 5,000 times the robot has to explore. So it doesn't finish the job, we preset we predefine 10,000 times, so the robot has to finish the job. So if the robot is already at the top of the, of the mountain, it still has to make proposals to move next, where to move. So as you could imagine, because it's nearly at the top of the mountain, wherever it goes, it's, it's lower than the relative, purport, relative position, okay? Similar idea, so the robot is making a proposal and it compares the ratio of the new place and the old place, the elevation ratio. So the elevation ratio in this case is 0.92. So the robot is going a little bit lower. So the probability to accept this proposal will be this ratio. So then the robot has a 92% of chance to go to this position and 8% of the chance to stay here, okay? Good. Another scenario is, so sometimes the robot is proposing somewhere a little bit further. It propose, it's proposing somehow a larger step, good. So let's say the robot is already at a mountain and it proposes somehow a further position and do the same calculation. The, do the, the same calculation is the ratio of elevation uh, between the new position and the old position. So in this case, new position is 0.2 over 6.2. So the ratio is 3%. So this means the robot will only have a 3% chance to accept the new proposal, to go to that position. And 97% uh, of the chance to stay at the current position, okay? Because it's too low, the robot doesn't want to go there. It, it wants to stay at the, the top of the mountain. So this is the intuition, good. So this is a rule, this is a simple rule of MCMC. Uh, 
it's in fact one of the simplest rules. MCMC can be relatively complicated, uh, but this is kind of one of the simplest intuition that I can have. So let me summarize. So there is a mountain, and then we want to know where it's high, where it's low. And let's say we have a robot that could help us to understand where it's high, where it's low, and then the robot doesn't have a vision. The robot has an elevation sensor. It could report the elevation information at each position. Okay. So if, <clears throat> if the, the robot is uh, at a lower position and it, it proposes somewhere higher, it goes there for a 100% chance. So it climbs. If the robot is already at somewhere higher, so it goes proportionally to lower places using the relative ratio between the new location and the, the current location. So if the ratio is okay, it's still like, like this, is above, I don't know, 0.5, so it has a above chance probability to go to the new position. And if uh, uh, the, the probability, the, the ratio is like here, then maybe it doesn't go to the new position often, okay? Good. And then let's say if we have a robot, it starts from the bottom left corner. Using the rule we have described, what the result will look like if we have the robot visited the entire mountain, 10,000 steps, for example. So would you be confident or comfortable to imagine that the, the visits, so the number of visits of the robot will be around here where the mountain is high and not too many times of visit here where the mountain is low. So would you be comfortable to imagine this, to think about it will be the case? So this in fact will be the case because, um, because the rule we have described, so if that climbs, it goes there 100%. And if it goes down, it uses some probability to accept the proposal or not. So eventually, if we ask the robot to move as many times as 10,000, for example, so the most of the, um, the visits, the locations, will be around here, around where the mountain is high. And when the mountain is low, the robot really doesn't, uh, doesn't really go too much, too often, to the new places. <laughs> I'll give you 10 seconds to think about it. Let me just read questions. <clears throat> so if the ratio, well, one question is, if the ratio represents the probability to go to a certain place, how can there be a ratio of 2.3? Yeah, so when it is above one, then the chance is one, yes, yes. Good. So now there is a really a mountain uh, example. So let's say we have a area, it, is, it has a square shape, squared shape. And then somewhere in the middle, there is really a mountain, so it's high and then the other places are low, okay? So there is a robot, it tries to go to the places to, to tell us where it's high, where it's low, okay? So this is only an illustration from 2D to 3D. The goal is always the same, to find the mountain where it's high, where it's low. And we have to go back to our example, we have to go back to our Bayesian formula. So the mountain is not a mountain. So the mountain is a product between the prior and the likelihood. So when the mountain is high, then that means, okay, the prior and the likelihood is high. So then that means the unstandardized posterior is high. And if the mountain is low, that means the unstandardized posterior is low. That is eventually we will have a shape of the, the unstandardized posterior, okay? And then we can also standardize it relatively easily when we have the sample to use. Good. <clears throat> so I can show you one example or two, honestly. Let's assume we have some parameter, okay? We have some, some, some knowledge about a parameter. Let's say we have a parameter of theta. And the theta could take seven values discrete. So it could take one, two, three, two, seven. Okay, so the relative chance of taking one, two, two, seven is different. It's not a flat prior, it's not a flat distribution, it's a, a linearly increasing distribution. So the chance of theta taking seven is the highest. The chance of theta taking value of one is the lowest. 
and then there's something in between. There's a linear shape. Okay, good. So let's assume this is something we know. Good. And then we could uh, ask the MCMC robots to do a visit. So this one, this gradient shape, now this is the mountain. So this is the mountain. Here is high, here is low. And we want to know where it's high, where it's low, right? And then we set up a MCMC robots starting from a random location. So here is like climb, right? So from four to five is a climbing on the mountain. So it goes there and here. So it goes, stays there for one more time and then goes back. Goes back is to calculate the ratio between here and here. It is still uh, quite high and then it still goes there. And occasionally it goes to low place, lower places because uh, there is a probability. It doesn't mean it doesn't go there. Uh, it never goes. It still goes, but just with a smaller uh, probability. Okay, so the MCMC robots goes here and then climb and then goes down and here a little bit going down. And uh, eventually it visits pretty often uh, the higher places. Okay. So those are the locations, those are the visits, the, vi the visits of, uh, of the MCMC robots. And now if you take the histogram of the visits, okay, if you take the histogram of the visits, here the robot visits one only three times. So here's three. And it wrote, it's visited two, this is, I don't know, around 10 times. So here's 10. And then if you do the same summing up, so this is a histogram, here it visits seven, like this amount of times. So this um, histogram after the visits, after the visits, using the rule we have described, is a good approximation of the true shape of the mountain. So another example is when it's continuous, okay? This one, the link you can click at home. I really do recommend you read it. Uh, it says zero math introduction to MCMC methods. So one of the figure I, 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 I borrowed, I steal from that blog post is this one. So let's say we have a true probability. This is a mountain. We want to know where the mountain is high. We want to know where the mountain is low. And we have a random kind of MCMC robot. It visits the places. So here the red dots it visits from somewhere outside the curve to, to like here. So each dot represents a visit, okay? So now it's around here. And will it climb or will it go to the place uh, where the mountain is not too high? So there's a rule we have described, right? So we, we, uh, the robot is using the ratio to decide whether or not to accept the proposal to visit a new location. Good. And then the, the robot is basically trying to climb and then to stay at the place where the mountain is high. And occasionally the, the robot is also going to somewhere relatively lower, okay? So here more visits. And if we take the histogram of all those visits, all those positions, so here in this bar, right? In this bar, this bar, the shape is a really good approximation of the, the true mountain, the underlying mountain of the parameter space. <clears throat> Okay, to summarize before we, we, uh, we finish today is that we sometimes have a unknown distribution. So that's the mountain. The mountain has somewhere high, somewhere low. And to solve it, because that's unknown and might be complex, we cannot do it analytically. And if we do a great approximation, it might take, it might take too long. It takes uh, forever. And we want to have a little bit more sophisticated approach to approximate where is high, where is low. We, we draw samples, we, we, we draw locations using some rule that we have described. And one way is to use MCMC, Markov Chain Monte Carlo. So you see all the samples will be a good approximation of the shape of the mountain. Good. And, uh, um, if there's a mountain, if we have one robot, if we let the robot go and then we collect the robot, we will have the information of the mountain. But if we want to have a stable estimation, sending one robot is not enough. We might want to send three or four robots. And if all of them, they report us the same 
height of the mountain. So if they have a convergent evidence that where the mountain is high, where the mountain is no, low, okay, we know, well, this is a, a reasonable and reliable information from the visits of the, of the robots. So then, um, uh, <clears throat> so we, we, we trust it more. And if we have multiple robots, it's better that we let them to start, we let them start from different random locations. So they start differently, but eventually they all go to the same place relatively often. So then this is a good uh, sign of uh, the visits. So here you can see one starting point is the, the yellow, another one is green, another one is blue. So all of them, they start differently from different locations. And eventually they, they all go here where, uh, some, where somewhere the, the density, the mountain is high. Okay, another illustration, here's a random location, random position. S starting from here, so the robot is trying to move to the place where the density is high, so where the mountain is high, and then it goes, uh, it moves around, okay? Still to the place where the, the mountain is relatively high. And then we use those visits uh, to, approximate, uh, to approximate the density shape. Good. The video, I think you can watch it from home it basically tells you um, how this mcmc works you can click this one so here uh, this is the visits and it goes uh, from here to here somehow uh, tries to approximate the shape of the distribution good so mcmc as i said it is a family of methods there are multiple mcmc and one of them is the most important one. It is called the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And Stan, it is the software that we will be focusing on. Stan employs HMC. So HMC is more efficient, sufficient, faster. And we will focus on that in the rest of the seminar. I think I'm done for today. And any questions? One question is, should we already download Stan? I guess, yes. So you, if you haven't installed this package, R Stan package in R, and you could install it, because we will use it uh, the next lecture. I can send you the link today how to install it if you haven't done so. Any other questions? Yeah, it is a package, yes, yeah, it's a R package. You can use that in Python, in MATLAB, or in command line. So the interface of uh, Stan in R is called R Stan. that's the package. <clears throat> Any questions, comments? Yeah, we, we, we cover the detail of Stan next time, not now. Another question, isn't there a command in R to download and install the Stan package? Yes, yeah, yes, but you have to have a, a little bit specifications. So I, I will send you the link today. Yeah, don't worry. Good, any other questions? Well, if not, um, I will see you next week. So feel free to email me if you have further questions and I will send you the instructions after it's done, okay?